Welcome, everyone. Uh, this session is Getting Stuff Done with R, Python, and Jupyter Notebooks. We have four panelists presenting today. Um, and our first, oh, we'll have first some logistics. Uh, ESIP likes to collect uh, notes from the audience. You can put those here. That is bit.ly slash put notes here. Um, we're going to begin with Chris Turner from, <laughs> no, how come it says Chris first? Oh, yeah, I know, that's kind of bad. <laughs> I know, it's like confused. Um, we're going to start with Colin Smith from the Environmental Data Initiative, and I will load, load his presentation. Here is a PDF. Come on. There we go. Yeah. It's covering up the how slideshow, isn't it? No. That'll automatically. Oh. I'll let you do it. Okay, here we go. All right, great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, you could hear me in the back just fine? Okay. Yeah, sorry. We'll, we'll move that out of there. Excellent. Okay, um, I'm going to be talking about the st uh, R, the statistical programming language. Uh, that's a bit quirky and slow, but extremely versatile and has a lot of, pot a lot of unrealized potential. So a little bit about myself. I am a data curator with the Environmental Data Initiative. Um, in my previous life, I was working in limnology and oceanography, actually just up the road here, um, working in the Nanus network, building out a, uh, a suite of um, uh, instrumented uh, buoys and uh, sensor networks. And the creative process involved, the creative problem solving process involved with the engineering and the maintenance and, and deployments and stuff was something that I really loved. And software development is that, um, though I don't necessarily love software development, but it's, it allows me to exercise that, uh, that process that I really enjoy. Um, the languages that I am familiar with are MATLAB, uh, a little bit of Perl and R. R is the one that I'm most familiar with as I've been operating in it for like the last four years or so. Um, so how I use R, um, in my previous life I was using it a lot for data processing, data visualization, analysis, um, tasks which R is, is, is excellent at doing. Um, now I am using it for data curation purposes mainly because that's the uh, language that our particular community um, communicates in. And so doing things from, you know, SSH file transfers, um, setting up web services, or at least um, the functionality that, that, that's supplied to web services, as well as accessing them, um, building tools for people to use to help with their data curation tasks, um, and, and building out workflows associated with those tools. Um, so one example is a taxonomy cleaner R package that I and some other people um, had developed, and it's meant to be a very lightweight way of resolving taxonomic data to an authority system and then rendering that into uh, metadata. So the user will supply a taxa, whatever rank level that happens to be, um, along with a um, authority system um, of, of preference to the taxonomy cleaner. And that returns um, 
the uh, the full rank for that organism if it can be resolved if not then nothing is returned because there's an assumption here that the name is accurately there's a couple assumptions the name and um the intent of that name is uh is uh one to one and then rendering that into eml so there's an example um package and workflow that i i've implemented in r another one is the eml assembly line which is um, the user supplies or parameterizes a data set, um, the metadata for it into a series of simple text files, free text and, and um, delimited. Um, and along with the help of some automated met metadata extraction, um, creates an EML document, which can be run over and over again as the data set updates. Um, and this, uh, this, this workflow, this uh, EML workflow can be implemented to automate data publishing so if you have a time series the only thing that's happening is new data are being appended you could just run the data through that process again and um, as well as uh, couple a, a, a publishing script on the back end of that okay awesome so in in the publishing side calling the api passing some credentials to the repository uploading um, in, in, in um, processing the response. Um, I, we, are, we haven't uh, done this yet, but this is something that we're gonna be implementing for one of our projects, um, reproducible science workflows. So coupling this EML assembly line R package that facilitates an automated metadata um, uh, and data package upload to a repository and using that in combination with event notifications from that repository to trigger downstream workflows and data products that can be rendered into a website or however you wanna share that information. So um, R supports this and um, I intend to be uh, implementing it in that. What do we got going on here? Uh-oh, press the wrong, how do I get back? To here. Oh, thank you, guest too. Uh, so some of the major characteristics of R, it's an implementation of the S language. It's an interpreted language, which means that the, um, the calls are executed directly rather than being processed through um, into a machine readable um, format first. Uh, it was born around August 1993 by Ross Ihaka, I believe, and Robert Gentleman. It's free and open source, maintained by the R core team, um, which is a group of individuals that help support evolution of the R language. Um, and importantly, it's compatible with um, all major operating systems. Um, it has a worldwide community, a, a very large user community um, it is um, it is very popular. This is uh, the TOB index, I believe, which is a way of ranking the, the popularity of different software languages. Here's a time series since 2008 uh, up to present. And relative to other languages, it currently stands at number 20 um, of all those that are out there. Um, R is used widely in the academic environment. Um, also uh, commercial application, um, and there's a lot of support groups out there uh, to interact with, you know, at a local level to share expertise and, um, and, and, um, and learn more. So R has a command line interface, or you can use an integrated developer environment like RStudio, which tends to be the preferred um, IDE, um, which facilitates scripting, uh, software profiling, debugging, testing, version control, and package development. It's a great um, interface to working with this language. Uh, the data structures are common to other languages. There are vectors, matrices, arrays, data frames, which are kind of unique, which is essentially like a table, but with different types of uh, data classes um, within respective columns um, or lists which can be nested, can contain objects of various sorts, um, very flexible uh, containers and 
uh, in environments, the environments in which functions are executed in and of themselves can be thought of of data as of data structures. Um, there are five object classes, um, and we could get into this in a little bit more detail um, in the questions and answers. Um, but supporting basically the common object. Uh, 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 the types of other languages, and then some others that have um, unique characteristics. Um, R supports non-standard evaluation, which um, is surprising to some people. So oftentimes, um, in a programming language, you're, you're only really able to ex access the value that is returned um, or, is, or is input. But in R, you could actually access the, the function call um, as well. Um, and it has a very strong functional programming foundation. Functions are actually um, kind of like objects, like vectors, so you can do things with functions that you can do um, with vectors. Um, for example, you could pass functions to a function and get function, you know, a modified function in return. Um, there are um, Generic functions, which are kind of related to the dispatch, which is um, depending on the class of the input, that function will then um, choose the appropriate method and apply the operation and return um, the, the, the corresponding output. Um, metaprogramming is essentially what I mentioned about being able to pass function, modify functions with other functions. So it's creating programs from other programs. Um, and then lazy evaluation of, um, of arguments that are supplied to it. The arguments are not evaluated until they are actually called upon. Um, R is very extensible through packages, open source packages. Um, currently, there are about 15,000 of them, um, and they're very easy to build and test within the R environment or to integrate into a continuous or, or to use a continuous integration service. Um, here we have a plot of the number of packages through time since 1997. Um, solid line is the total number of packages contributed to CRAN, and the dashed line are the number of beta versions. Um, uh, in, in CRAN. The strengths of R, um, available on all major platforms. Um, excellent for solving data-oriented problems, um, which is accessible to most scientists or be, uh, beginning scientists. Doesn't require um, formal training or no, um, expertise often associated with a more formal programming language. It's excellent at statistics, um, machine learning, data manipulation, data visualization, um, parallel computing, um, facilitating reproducible research, and uh, generating reports and websites as well. There's, um, there, there's a, a R markdown language in which um, you can use to create HTML or PDF documents and so forth and, and build kind of a narrative uh, script that produces a report. Or there are some packages out there now that render the, um, uh, um, the structured metadata that comes along with an R package and creates a nice website for your project. Um, and it's a very versatile language. Um, again, uh, a strength is the functional, the foundation in functional programming. Um, the metaprogramming is, is a pretty unique and um, a strong feature. Um, connects to other languages, has a very large user community, and is at the cutting edge of academic research. So if there are, um, if there's a new question or statistical method, uh, there's a good chance that there's an R package out there from which you can use or you could build from build upon. Um, some of the weaknesses of R um, that most of the users are not programmers, so the derived um, software that is then packaged and made available for people to use and that people build upon and so forth um, is not very, there's not a lot of deep, uh, a lot of emphasis placed on the process rather than the than the product and how you how you get there. So that can be an issue. 
Um, readability of metaprogramming can be awfully challenging and difficult, um, which, which is an issue in R sometimes. Um, the development of the core uh, the package um, over 20 years or so has there there has been um, various inconsistencies from contributors, so that makes things um, a little bit disjointed and inefficient and um, and, and difficult to uh, navigate. Um, there's not a ton of uh, support for integration um, of R into various frameworks, though that's improving. Um, security can be a bit of an issue sometimes, and um, is oftentimes uh, slower than some of the alternatives that are out there. And, and a lot of this relates to memory management, copy on modify um, uh, methods that R uses um, when transforming objects and so forth that can be an issue. Um, now realizing R's full potential, the R core team is the group that's really managing um, that core software base and they're fairly conservative in making any radical changes you know they do things incrementally very slowly for a good reason to keep everything stable and operating um, but it kind of limits them in terms of being able to address some of these um, core inefficiencies um, that can maybe be applied elsewhere and which are um, addressed in uh, development of ecosystems of new uh, software packages. Thank you, Gasto. And um, so the tidyverse is one example of that, trying to get interoperable code that addresses some of these inefficiencies and some of these quirks and like iron that out. Um, but then there's some other implementations of R. There's pretty quick R, R engine, fast R, uh, R riposte or something like that. And anyway, these are um, these projects um, in order of uh, um, decreasing order. Um, are uh, increasing in speed, um, but but less so in, in stability. So these are some other implementations that um, you might want to check out um, that address some of these issues. Resources are for data science. These are all open source PDF uh, freely available online. Um, R for data science is a is a, is a a great introduction to um, data science for. Um, more of a science science base r packages great for anybody who wants to create an r package advanced r excellent for anyone that wants to re improve the efficiency and get into the details of working in the r language there's the r journal put out by the r um, um, foundation with just kind of updates on what's going on with the core team and and where the language is is going and then the web is put r on the end of anything and and, and you could search for any sort of a issue and associated with it. And that is all I have for you right now. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Next, we have John Porter from the Virginia Coast LTER. Oh, yes. Yeah, if there's any questions for Colin while she's pulling things up. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Colin says I can answer for him. You're muted. She should be good. Okay. You Finder. Get it, get it escape to get out of that one. Yeah. Or, I was going to open up. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. The, where'd it go? Shit. It's, here, don't redo it. So, this is John Porter from the Virginia Coast LTER site, and he's going to give an overview of Python. Okay, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, how many people think here think Python was named after a snake? Good. Everybody knows it was named after Monty Python, the comedy troupe. So the editor in Python is actually called the Idle Editor after Eric Idle of, of Monty Python. Anyway, uh, I thought uh, in terms of trying to summarize Python, I thought 
what could you do better than Wikipedia? So what I've got here is a word cloud drawn from the entry on Wikipedia. From this, we learn that Python is a programming language, uh, that, it, uh, that it has classes, that there you have statements, there's different implementations. Uh, but these are, are things that you would commonly see with a programming language. Later on in the presentation, we'll actually get it to compare it to R's word tree. So you have a little contrast there. Now, how many people here have used one or more of the languages that are up on the screen? Okay, wow, okay. So you guys have, you guys are, we're already dealing with folks that know about programming, okay? So, where does Python fit in here? Well, if I were to say which language Python was sort of closest to, I would probably say Perl. Okay, that's why Perl is a language that I've used a, a lot for a lot of uh, scripting tasks. Uh, there is a, a difference between Python and Perl. Perl tends to be what they call a, a, a write-only language in the sense that the code is so nasty to look at that you, if, you, if somebody hands you a piece of, of uh, Perl code, you might have a very hard time understanding it. Uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, things like R, there's actually, you'll, we'll see later, there's a lot of overlap between what you can do in R and you can do in Python, but the difference is going to be how, what you have expertise in. Somebody that's really good in R can do lots of things that, 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 they, that you can do in Python and vice versa. Uh, but there's some things that Python definitely does, does better. It's a more general purpose language. Um, this is one of the reasons why a lot of people like Python. This is the uh, the classic hello world, as written in Java, as written in C++, and as is written in Python. Okay, Python puts a, a premium on trying to make things as, as simple and as readable as possible. Uh, one of the things that's uh, actually built into Python is what they call the Zen of Python. This is a list of, uh, of uh, 19 principles. They set aside one for the, the person who originally wrote Python to add a 20th, and he never got around to it. So there's only 19. Uh, beautiful is better than ugly. Explicit is better than implicit. And I won't read the whole list. I will note that there are things like uh, 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 special cases aren't special enough to break the rules, although practicality beats purity. So there's a little little bit of back and forth there. And I and the one that you're probably wondering about most is the pair that says there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. And then it says, although that way not be obvious at first unless you're Dutch. And that's because the developer of Python was, of course, Dutch. <laughs> uh, the, um, so, the, so built into sort of the ethic of Python is trying to make it, we have so many languages that are so overloaded with different dialects, uh, probably PHP comes to mind. It's, one, it's a language that was almost designed by a committee and to do any particular thing in PHP, there's probably a dozen different ways to do it. The idea in Python is to not have that proliferation of ways and make it so that we're all speaking the same language and not different, different dialects of it. Um, uh, Python is actually more widely used than, than R. Uh, I, this is the, uh, the uh, TOB index for, uh, for Python, uh, whereas the R1 topped out at about 2.5, this goes up to uh, about 8. And as, as you can see, its popularity has sort of been going, going up recently. It, has, it does sort of go up and down. But uh, uh, one of the things about it is that uh, while R is primarily used by people that are doing statistical analysis, Python is used by people for doing all sorts of things that may have nothing to do with statistics or, or anything else. Uh, it's designed, again, to be easy to write, easy to read, 
And that makes it sort of an attractive place to start. Lots of universities have courses in introductory programming courses that are using Python. I found that it's uh, that it's worked really well for interacting with the web. If you want to down, have a, a script that's going out and pulling information off the web, Python's a really strong choice for that. Like Perl, it's really good at doing pattern matching and parsing things. So that if you're trying to make sense of something, it's a it's a, a good one to have. The other thing also is that it's it's many other types of software will have Python interfaces. Probably the one that may be best known by the people in this room is the ArcPy package in ArcGIS. That's the, the package that allows you to write Python code that use any of the functionality that's available in ArcGIS. So you could basically do your whole analysis just by running a Python script. Um, comes in comes in very handy from time to time when you have things that take 45 minutes to run once and you need to run it 20 times. Um, just like R, uh, Python has lots and lots of specialized modules. These are similar to the packages that Colin talked about that allow you to perform particular functions. He said R's got 15,000. I'm not sure how many Python has, but it, it's also a lot. Uh, some examples are ones that allow you to talk to databases. So if you need to do some scripts that are going to extract information or put information into a database, Python can do that. Uh, just last night, I had the experience of, uh, of needing to parse through about 6,000 uh, metadata documents in XML. Python was was up for that. It took uh, about a half a page of code to to extract all the paths from all the documents. Uh, there's also uh, a, a package called Pandas, and there's also NumPy, and um, uh, that have a lot of the sort of R-like data structure. So they have something that's comparable to a data frame and things like that. So uh, those capabilities are there. And then also for things like JSON, which is a way of communicating rapidly data over the web, there are modules in Python that will allow you to do that. Uh, now in Python, everything is going to be an object. And so uh, one of the things is that uh, when you're actually writing the code and you type in the name of an object and put a period, it actually pops up this list in the in the idle interface that gives you a list of all of the functions that might be applied to it. Since this is a string, we could capitalize it, or we could center it, or we could count how many letters there were in it, or we could uh, 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 find out what it ends with. We could take whatever tabs might have been in the string and expand them. There, there's a, there, as you can see, this is a, a long list of things that you can do with strings, but they're there for you to, to see as well. Uh, Python is, uh, is, is relatively straightforward in terms of if, if, if most of you are familiar with some programming language, there's nothing here that's sort of going to surprise you. You can assign values to variables and you can then run functions on them. And then uh, the, the last one there is sort of that syntax of where we've got a, a string, uh, a string D, and we want to convert it to uppercase, and so we put dot upper, and that's going to then apply that upper function to whatever was in that, that string. Uh, loops, uh, the, it basically supports both while and for loops. One of the things that's important about Python, though, is that you notice that uh, some of you are probably going, where are the semicolons? Something's wrong, there should be semicolons. Python doesn't do semicolons, and it doesn't do curly brackets to speak of. So what it does instead is it depends on the fact that you're indenting things. So the fact that this day, that the inside of the loop is indented over is the thing that defines where the loop begins and ends, is, is, is simply the indentation. This tends to make it so that it, it really is sort of enforcing good standards in terms of a appearance there. Um, it supports a, a variety of, uh, of data structures. Uh, uh, lists are a common one, again, where you can store 
uh, data essentially is a, a one-dimensional uh, array, though uh, more dimensions are possible. And here's a, uh, a little example of a Hello World program that sort of throws all of those things together. This is one where I've, uh, I've created a, a string called statement and assigned Hello World all lowercase to it. I then printed it out. So we see the first thing that prints out on our output is Hello World as we put it in. And then I uh, go through a for loop and print it out five more times. And on even number of ones, I, uh, I uh, change it to, or on odd numbered ones, I change it to uppercase. And on even numbered ones, I change it to capitalization where it capitalizes each word, again, using those functions. Uh, but hopefully that code, if, if anybody tried this in Perl, or in C++ or Java, this is a, a more readable thing. Um, now, how do I use Python? I use it uh, a lot for things where I'm parsing things. If I have a, a, a data logger that's creating, uh, has a complex header on top of it, and I need to pull the serial number out of that in order to uh, put it with the rest of the data, I go straight to Python for that. Yeah, you can do it in R, but it's, it's harder. Uh, I do for creation and uh, use of web services. I, I have programs that will go and, and tally all how often the data from my site is being used. XML processing, again, that's a capability that's available in lots of the other languages. And then a big one is GIS programming because you've got that ArcPy module that's doing it. And then we've got uh, automating uh, database activities because again, it can talk directly to databases. Now. Lots of other people use it for more than scripting. There are large software projects like the, the Open Science Framework, all written in Python, you know, big GUIs, the, the whole business. There's also lots of, uh, of uh, st things for doing statistical analysis, sort of R-like things. Uh, lots of tutorials, lots of books. Not all of these are, are free the way Collins were, but uh, if you go out there, you can find something that will, will speak to you. Uh, if you don't like one book, try another because there will be one that's, uh, that's at the level you're looking for. Uh, this is the, the two uh, uh, trees for Python and, uh, and R, R on the left, Python on the right. And uh, what you tend to see is that R has sort of statistical up there in big letters where statistical sort of a small thing in R or excuse me, small thing in Python because that's not something it, it, uh, it focuses on so heavily. Uh, again, lots and lots of overlap. The, the difference between what you can do in R, things that you can do in R and things you can do in Python is often very small. The difference is what you have the most expertise in doing and some things are going to be easier in Python than R, but that doesn't mean they can't be done in R. So I, uh, I I will leave you with this uh, with this comic book comic from XKCD that was labeled Python, which has a guy flying around. He says, "How are you? You're flying how?" And he says, uh, "says Python." And then uh, uh, he he talks about the the good things about Python, and uh, when he's asked how how is he flying, he just said he imported anti gravity. When you, do, you use the command import to pull in these modules, so somewhere there's an anti-gravity module he's pulled in and now he's flying around. So just in case, that's a little hard to see on the, the screen, screen there. But I will, uh, as, as you all know, uh, you have to be cautious when doing programming and I'll leave it with that and let the folks from uh, tell us about Jupyter Notebooks. Excellent, we have 45 seconds remaining for questions, I'm done. So next up, we do have Chris Turner from the North North <laughs> Northern Gulf Alaska LPR site, and I will load his Google Slides. Close this. Close ah. And this is this is you here, yeah? Yeah. Okay, and I'll set you for 15 minutes. Okay. <clears throat> 
Hello, uh, I'm Chris Turner, the Information Manager for the Northern Gulf of Alaska LTER site, one of the new sites that started in 2018. Um, and I'm also the Data Librarian at Axiom Data Science, um, where I wear many hats, one of which is the Information Manager role for the NGA site. Um, we also do data management for a handful of other research and monitoring programs, and the company does some cyber infrastructure development. So the hat that I'm wearing as I speak to you now is kind of a general representative of Axiom. The, the, the examples that I show you are not mine specifically, but they're things that we have done internally that I think are good uses of notebooks. Um, so the title is Getting Things Done with Jupyter Notebooks. And there's a, I, I was worried that people might not actually know what Jupyter Notebooks were. I've heard them mentioned a lot at ESIP this year. Um, so probably most folks do have some idea. But for those who don't, you can think of it sort of like an IDE in your browser. It's not quite an IDE. It's not so fully featured. Um, but it's a way to create these documents that have uh, runnable code, the results of that code, and um, you can interact with those results uh, and create um, visualizations like you see here. And you can have these large blocks of uh, markdown-based annotation be put between these blocks of code to create sort of a, a really literate code-esque uh, narrative for the, the piece of code you're writing and sharing. Um, in practice, you can think of the notebooks less as this like web app environment, or that's what they kind of are, and just as these documents of cells of code with annotation and results. Um, so Jupyter Notebooks come from Project Jupyter, which is all open source and nonprofit. It evolved out of the IPython project in 2014 or 15, as that project expanded beyond the Python ecosystem and started to do a lot more interactive data science and science, uh, scientific computation. Um, Project Jupyter maintains not just the notebooks, but also the um, infrastructure for the server that you can run the notebooks on. They have a couple of different tools for easily experimenting with notebooks online. Um, and I think recently have released Jupyter Lab, which is kind of our studio-ish full-fledged IDE for notebooks that I don't have any experience with, but it looks awesome. Um, there's a lot of ways to get started with notebooks for free. If you're at an institution that um, is supporting your use of notebooks, probably you've already spun up your own server. Um, these are all free options where you can go and create notebooks, and they're all, I think they're all pretty easy. I haven't, I haven't experimented with all of them, um, but the ones that I have have been pretty easy. The free has a little asterisk because they're not totally free. There's limitations on storage or computation. Um, but I encourage you to just get in there and check them out. If you don't want to just dive in, there are some reviews and discussions. Uh, of what's good and a link to how you can host your own server. Um, and these links are all in the notes, which you guys can all have and go through these on your own time. Um, so how do we use Jupyter Notebooks at Axiom? There's these three not mutually exclusive at all kind of general themes for how we use them. We use them for a lot of data management and processing scripts. These are things that are uh, ad hoc uh, or, or one-off project-based ingests for data types that we're not going to see again. It's not something that we're going to do often enough or want to invest enough time on to ingest and to make part of our uh, Git repo. It's not going to be part of our code base. It's just a you know single project. Um, we use it to demonstrate either how to do some analyses or how to access some of the data that we have in our data system. Um, and we use it especially for projects that have especially large data sources that might be very onerous to download and operate on locally, either as an entire data set or in pieces. So things like model results and satellite imagery, if you want to deal with a lot of that, it's a lot easier for us to use notebooks on the same infrastructure where we have our storage. So it's, there's, no, uh, there's no transfer limitation. Um, so as an example of um, some of these data management and processing ways that we use this, um, this is work that we just did for Audubon Alaska. They have um, a series of atlases looking at um, environmental health of the region. And so they contacted us to try and make a digital version of their ecological atlas of the Bering, Chukchi, and Beaufort Seas. And this is something they spent a lot of time on. They worked with a cartographer and a designer. A lot of custom work went into it. So when they came to us with these many, many, many data layers, um, we couldn't just map what they gave us. It was a lot of taking a bunch of different spatial, uh, spatial products and trying to sort of recreate what they had done in print. Um, so the analysts that we had working on this were working together with pretty poorly or I mean it was it was really functional but not not well defined boundaries between whose responsibility or which data set so using notebooks that they could share and annotate where they were and what wasn't working was a good way for them to collaborate uh, when they yeah on each of these layers um, it was real important to us to make it look exactly like they had uh, like like their print version it was real important to them 
uh, and obviously that's going to be pretty one-off work because it's such a special data type. So we did that, um, and there's links there if you want to check out the interactive web version or the, um, the print version. I'll say now that I regret that I uh, embedded all these links behind the text so you guys can't see where to go right now, so I apologize. But if you look at the slides, you can get there. Um, and the slides are linked to from the notes document that Castillo showed at the beginning of the talk. Um, another way that we use notebooks is for, as I said, demonstrations. Um, so we've created this, this gallery of demonstration notebooks, and that one I did put the um, full link in. So if you're following along on your laptop, you can go there and check these out right now. Um, but these are all different, um, different uses of notebooks to access uh, large data sets that we have on our data system. It's primarily gridded stuff, but you can see down in the bottom right corner those like spectrograms from a bunch of acoustic files. These are things that the scientists who work with us put in a ton of time to, to create these data products. They want them to be reused and we wanna make it easier to reuse them. So we've created these notebooks so folks can both see how to access these in our data system and see how to do sort of simple analyses across what might be you know, multiple terabytes or multiple years of these big uh, products. So one example is the, uh, is the Chuck Chi Beaufort uh, high resolution atmospheric reanalysis model results. This is a multi-terabyte, 31-year um, set of model result data. It's pretty hard to work with um, if you want to do anything with it locally. Even on the web, it's continually pulling down new data. It takes forever. Uh, using a notebook on the same, uh, the that's being uh, run, collocated with the data, it's pretty fast to, to, to go through this, calculate climate normals. You're just looking at averages across all these files, um, and then plot these anomalies, save these, and put them in your report. Um, Another similar example uh, of looking at a giant gridded data set is the California harmful algal bloom risk uh, model. Um, this is another one of these giant pile of net CDFs that's really onerous to work with on your own. Um, but you can come to this and see how we use the notebook. Um, yeah, the notebook's illustrative, I guess, of how you can analyze this. Whew. Um, another example that we created for the scientists in our community is, um, if you saw Matt Jones talk yesterday, he showed some of Josh London's telemetry data um, and how he was able to analyze it with the whole tail project in data one, which is super cool. I hadn't seen that before. That was really impressive. We use the same, uh, this is a different uh, telemetry set, but the same crawl model that he used um, to, to show how to do an R notebook. It's um, most people are using Python still. We wanted to have some R examples, so we use this because Josh has done some really great instruction on how to make it easy. So we use a lot of Josh's instruction and code and implemented his, his, uh, his crawl. It's a random walk state space model um, on a bearded seal. Um, you can see 33 cells later, you get these, um, you get these modeled uh, telemetry tracks for the animal. Um, so that was a neat example for folks to see how to use R in the, in the workspace. Which I haven't talked about, I apologize, use R in a notebook. Um, but then we thought, what more could we do with that? And the, the, the crawl track is not super big, but a lot of the environmental covariates that we would want to look at with that are very big. They're model results, they're satellite images. It's hard to do much. But we decided it would be fun to make, a, make an animation of all of those environmental covariates where the animal is based on its location on telemetry track. So we made this track. It's 7,000 individual frames um, pulling from several of these multi-terabyte data sets. It took about 15 minutes to create all the plots and then another 30 minutes to render the JPEG, or the MPEG rather, but it is, so this is something that would have been much harder to do locally on a desktop, but using the notebooks in the cloud, co-located with the data storage, pretty fast. So this is pretty sweet. The sea surface temperature is from uh, the global high resolution sea surface temperature. The sea ice is the NSIDC product. Um, the bathymetry is giant gridded product, the international bathymetric chart of the ocean. And then on the bottom, it's just hourly travel speed for this seal. Um, we can let it run for a few, but yeah, it's sweet. Once it gets into the winter, you'll see the sea ice come down, it's better. Yeah, so he's coming down following the ice, it's fun. Uh, okay, so that's how we use them, some of the ways that we use them. Um, some of the strengths to these are that they're, 
they're pretty easy to get started. I showed that list of 18 or 20 options to get started for free. Standing up your server is pretty easy. Um, they're interactive, which is which is fun if you're creating, uh, if you're doing your analyses in there and you want to share them, it's, for, it's fun for people to go and like be able to slide around and look at different time slices uh, or to rerun things and see how, see how your charts spin up. Um, and with the markdown based documentation, they're super readable and you can create like really great literate pieces of scientific code. Uh, they're easy to share. There are a lot of uh, these environments online where you can post your notebooks, where you can see notebooks other folks have created, and you have tons of options. Uh, the Jupyter project supports R, Python, and Julia natively, but the, the Jupyter community has created these 130 plus other kernels, so there's tons of options. If there's a language you're interested in, chances are someone has done it in a notebook, um, and you can use their work. And then as far as the downsides, um, they can be a little bit easy to make mistakes in. The cells have to be run in order and it's pretty easy to get out of order. Um, Jupyter Notebooks themselves are not an IDE. Jupyter Lab fixes some of these problems, but um, you know, there's no linting, syntax highlighting, so it's, it can be hard to find mistakes when you make them. Um, and like, like Colin said about R, most of the users are not serious programmers or a lot of the new users are not. And so a lot of the examples you find perhaps don't follow uh, best practices for software development. And I guess that ties into the next step of encouraging bad habits. A lot of these examples, um, you just need to, to be cautious about before, adapt, before using them as a cookbook to make your own notebooks. Um, and if you're using someone else's notebook environment, you may not know what libraries they've added. And so it's, it can be hard to know if you're going to have all your dependencies. Um, uh, so I've added some links to some more criticisms that go into much more detail and some best practices that, that a few different communities have tried to create in response to these other criticisms. So I encourage you all to dig into the slides in those links uh, to learn more if you want to learn more. And then that's all that I have. And I, I still have two minutes if anyone has questions or we can just go right to space and do questions at the end. I see a question. So I think the, the question was whether we were watching that in a notebook or whether it was created in a notebook. Uh, it was it was created in a notebook, but we were wa it, the product of that notebook was the MPEG video, and so I just put that video in the slide. But, okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a couple questions. Um, one, I'm, I'm on the session space in ESIP. And now we're going to have more Jupyter Notebook examples this time from Stace Below from the Northeast Shelf, US Shelf, LT. Or, oh, there was one more question? Oh, come on up, Chris. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I just uh, sort of overall for the session, um, question would be uh, if we could get these, these slides posted on the, the ESIP session page, that would be fantastic because I would love to come back and reference some of these links. We will. Um, and uh, another follow-up question of, it would be really, really useful, I know for, for me and my team, if there was some sort of list or repository of the various Python and notebook libraries that folks have found or made, I think that would be super useful. Because, like you said, you don't always know what libraries people have imported. It would be nice to know what libraries are available. Um, so, in the let's see if I can navigate here. Uh, so, on, on this slide, in some of these like shareable environments, there, there's a lot of um, there's, there's information there about what um, what libraries are available in, in which sort of in each of the environments that are free and public. Um, I think, in theory. If there's a Python library you want, you can install it. If you're going to spin up your own notebook server, you can have all the libraries you want. You can use pip from inside the notebook. You can also use bash commands if you're going to install from a Git repo. So if, if you determine what you want and you're going to spin up your own notebook, you can have everything. But if you're looking for, uh, if you're looking for a sort of pre-built notebooks environment, there are a lot of those that are very comprehensive as well that might have like most of the Conda's environments and such. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Stace Folliou from Woods Hole Oceanographic. And um, I was sitting here thinking, like, 
I mean, I already knew that my key points were a subset of Chris's key points. So I'm thinking, what do I love about the ESEP meeting is that I learn from my peers, right? So I was thinking, okay, what do I want people to get out of my talk today? I want, I want, I'm hoping that for those of you who have never used Jupyter Notebooks or have never used some of these programming languages that we're talking about, that you can at least know that we are people to come to afterwards to talk about um, how to, how to get onboarded with these type of technologies, how to adopt these, why would you even wanna adopt these new technologies? And in my talk today, I'm gonna to actually use John because John asked me beforehand, why would I wanna start using Jupyter Notebooks? I already use Python and in, in, you know, in, in other um, IDEs and such. And uh, Chris mentioned he has a couple of hats. I also have a couple of hats on. So the information management for the Northeast US shelf is new. That I've only been doing that like two years. And what my bigger hat is, is at the Oceanographic, I'm the Ocean Informatics Coordinator. So what that means is that I help people at our institution adopt new technologies such as Jupyter Notebooks and our Markdown, referring back to Colin's talk. And um, I looked at my email ahead of this talk and it, I, I started trying to help people adopt Jupyter, note, Jupyter Notebooks when they were called IPython Notebooks back in 2012. And I can remember the day I sat in my office and I was a MATLAB user for 20 years. I sat in my office and I did my first IPython notebook that embedded a visualization in the same document. And Chris used the word document. And I, I literally sat there and I said, this is a game changer. It, it, changed, it changes the way a scientist can express how they have done an analysis. And the, I try to bring this to our students. And in fact, so I started with Python note, or Jupyter uh, notebooks several years ago, but in the past two years, I've actually put more emphasis in the R markdown and knitting to HTML outputs. So I have experience in helping people adopt um, both these kinds of notebook technologies. And by the way, I am not a programmer. I am come from a science background, although I was a nerd and I went to computer camp and all that, okay. but. Um, I'm one of those users that Colin is probably scared of because I know enough about programming that I can use the technology, but I don't probably develop with all the important software development practices. But I would actually argue, Colin, that that is a strength of the R because it allows people that come from a science background to start learning software development and get into that you know, world to help them become, um, have developed workflows that are more reproducible. Right, even to just describe their own work and then to describe to others. And I have to recognize um, the programmer who I do work with is Joe Futrell. He's listed here on the slide. And uh, Joe and I work very closely on a team that we call the Informatics Bridging Team. Okay, so now I'm gonna, and by the way, I am not a Mac user, so I'm gonna try to learn how to go to the next slide. Okay. Okay, great. So the two reasons why I'm using Jupyter Notebooks lately are one in my information management practices and the other in um, how I engage scientists and students with data. In this case, I'm gonna use data from our LTER as an example. And we've developed two repositories for notebooks in our project, the LTER project, one of which is more aligned with the code library for information management and the other for examples that we provide and teach with um, our scientists and students. So an example for data management is well aligned with what Chris was showing, although my example is really simpler. Um, most of our use of, of these sort of notebooks is on local systems and with, um, you know, we haven't expanded into the world of putting the uh, analysis where the big data are. At the moment, these are for kind of small practices for, um, in this case, um, dealing with specific fixes that might involve parsing a data set. Like basically, John, this is for you. Okay, we wanna do some specific fix to a data set received that we don't, so we wanna do a little bit of cleaning, but it doesn't, it's basically gotta get the data into a format that we're used to, and we don't wanna have to adopt that bit of code into our code library. So we do it outside the code library in a notebook. And the notebook allows us to record the provenance for that fix. So the provenance in this case is unstructured, but it's readable by a human, including any graphs you made of the analysis, or of, sorry, of the preparation. And just to point out a couple features of these uh, notebooks, Chris mentioned this as well. The notebooks include code cells, 
the output of those code cells and documentation of those code cells. So that's why it becomes a document that's shareable and readable by humans. So I'd like to focus more on how we engage our scientists and students with the data. And so the example I have to show you is with regard to a comparison of the scientists or students data with the, what we call the core data from our uh, project, the LTER. In this case, the ship provided data. So we, our project has a lot of research cruises. The ship has um, underway data, CTD cast data, those sort of data. And a lot of times the scientists will take physical samples that are analyzed later in the lab and they want to compare their results back to a physical measurement done during the cruise. So these sort of notebooks are great to share with people to um, help, them fig help them see how to do such an, a comparison. The notebook, uh, as Chris mentioned, used the word document. It's a nice way to provide the documentation in a single interface. And per in particular, the Jupyter notebooks render nicely in GitHub. And by the way, that is one little difference between using um, the Jupyter with Python and using um, our Markdown HTML knitting. Those don't render as well. That said, you can use uh, an R kernel with a Jupyter notebook and it will render nicely in GitHub. And I don't know if my students are online, but if they are, I did want to point out that we have two students this summer that are addressing um, some, uh, shout out to Colin on the reproducible workflows with R. Um, they're producing R markdown um, and notebooks that do some visualizations for cruises for our PIs. So the example I'll show you quickly, if I can navigate to it, will be a comparison of uh, seat, or, uh, basically a cast that's done off the side of the ship with samples that were analyzed later. And I am going to try this. I thought it would be good just to like actually show you a notebook on GitHub, which as we know with a live demo, it may or may not work. Great, and this is what I mean by, um, okay, yes, good, okay, it is rendering. So what works really well with our scientists and students is that we can provide them an example like this, point them to a link on GitHub, which is under version control, and they can just scroll down and they can see how we have provided them with some code and we are displaying, in this case, the output. And we, again, are giving them examples of how we're, in this case, using Python pandas package to, um, figure out which columns in their data tables they want to plot and then ultimately at the bottom of this notebook i will actually show you how we can show them the plot in the same um, document and the fact that the, the scientists and the students are able to do this by just clicking a link in github they're they're understanding and they're they're able to do literally do copy and paste from our code cells and then repurpose this these snippets of code for their own purposes Okay, I'll get back. Wow, I navigated, awesome. Okay, so to summarize the strengths and weaknesses as I see Jupyter Notebooks with Python. So for data management, it's keeping special cases out of our code library and um, allowing us to retain the provenance for those fixes. There's proven success. And I have a little asterisk here because I actually wrote, this is my one and only publication in informatics so far. I wrote a paper about how to use, um, in that case, it was IPython notebooks with scientists. And that was with a group of fishery scientists. So that was, um, I thought it was a great success to onboard people with this new technology. A weakness is now we have to manage the notebooks. So it's just another set of documents that you have to manage. And in terms of engaging the scientists and students, they have to learn not only the programming language, but now they also have to learn the notebook technology. So it is a bit of a hurdle to um, learn multiple technologies. And uh, Chris had this link on one of his lists of you know, resources of why, when and why to use notebooks. I love this one in particular. Um, it's actually 125 slides of why you might use or not use or hate or love notebooks. And um, I just, I'm gonna highlight, uh, oh, I didn't, oh, it's on the slide. So the, so the number one reason that it works well, the strength is um, by the combination of the code documentation and visualization. And the number one reason which Chris pointed to as well, why, oh, they, they sometimes really fail is because of running the cells in a particular order. And finally, um, I just wanted to stress that 
The examples that I showed you today are very simple and they can be run on a local system with examples provided by GitHub, but we at our LTER, because we don't have access to any of those listed resources, including research workspace, uh, Amazon Web Services and such, that was a Chris's page had like 20 things listed, none of which I have access to because of that asterisk, which, which was you had to pay for them. Um, so we uh, just got a grant uh, to use the um, Jetstream, NSF's funded XSEED Jetstream services. So we're going to test that out with our students this year. That's it. Thanks. I would like to invite our panelists to come respond to questions. So now we reach the synthesis portion of the analysis. <laughs> um, which tool we would use for what? And, and I believe we want to solicit examples from the audience of which tool you found most useful for what application. Is that right, John? Yeah. Uh, yeah, OK, this is live. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to get, uh, you know, if people have questions about any of the things that, you, that you've that you heard, uh, the fact that most of you have some background in programming means that some of the questions might be a little technical. But the other thing also that we'd like to do is be thinking about what can ESIP be doing to sort of help make it easier. You know, the reason you're here is because you wanted to learn something more about one of the technologies we've talked about. And the question is maybe what can we do to make it so that it's easier for you to get additional information? So let's uh, just start off, just raise your hand and, uh, and, and ask questions and uh, we'll do our best. Thank you all very much for the informative uh, presentations and, and regarding your last question. When you present, it's, you learn a lot, but I think, you know, something where there is a hands-on demonstration or, or hands-on demos where, you know, people have, whether it be R or Jupyter Notebooks uh, loaded and work through and, and go through a GitHub example, I think that would be really the most formative in terms of getting people online and going. And also a, a canned, a very simple, but canned lab that you could then share with coworkers or students. And I think that's the way you really would get traction moving forward because you can watch a presentation and it's great and you all are doing amazing stuff, but then you go back and you go, you know, wow, I have two hours to, you know, I have an hour to prep for class. Do I have time to really set up a demo? I'd love to respond to that question, which was with respect to having hands-on practice to help people adopt this, um, this try out, test it and figure out if they want to use the technology. So perfect example, um, I've been running workshops from le lengths between one hour and two days. Um, and it's, it's so important to be able to have that live training with the live coding and just yesterday, I went to the Pangeo session and I sat there and I figured out how to put my own notebooks into the Pangeo services. And on uh, Monday of next week, we're hoping to offer our first workshop with binder serve notebooks. Finally, I've been trying to get to that point for years to be able to offer through the binder services um, because in a very short workshop, hour, hour and a half, it's too difficult to have all the software installed. I mean, true with our studio, you, you can pull it off. With our studio, usually people can come to the room set up. But for Jupyter Notebooks, it's very hard to make sure everyone in the room on their different platforms is set up appropriately. But with the binder technology allowing you to interact online with the notebooks um, having the environment in the cloud, it's such a game changer. I'm looking, um, I'll tell, I wish I could tell you how, if it works out on Monday. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was also going to say that, uh, you know, one of the things that's nice about ESIP is there is a good sort of uh, video uh, uh, sharing technology and things like that. So it might be possible to set up some smaller groups to do it. Uh, one of the things that, 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 of course, the best way to learn in terms of the R and, uh, and Python is the best way to learn programming is to program. But it's really, really helpful to have somebody there who can point out where you've got a problem that's got you stumped 
as to you know maybe what the answer is. And with the sh the screen sharing technologies that we have with the video conferencing, it doesn't necessarily have to be in person. So maybe there maybe we can think about some opportunities to to set up some some training events that uh, 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 you know uh, people could do re remotely there. Other. Uh, Um, have none of you heard of something called ESAPUB? <laughs> yeah, so what's ESAPUB? It's a, it's a Jupyter um, hub server environment run explicitly for use during ESIP uh, meetings so far where, where you can solve this problem of the setup of having the right libraries and, and the right things like that and everybody can be running those things from Jupyter Hub. It was an idea that was hatched uh, at the Bloomington meeting uh, and then and, and used last summer in Tucson and there was a whole session about it. So um, let's see, uh, Rich Signell was involved in it and Sean Gordon was involved in it and um, someone else whose name I'm not thinking. But so if you if, if groups in ESIP are interested in having you know a hub environment set up because we had the same problem that you just mentioned, Stace, of like uh oh, you know, have I have I pip installed this, and do I have everything I need? And mine is crashing, and blah 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 blah. So we at Bloomington we made this idea of Jupiter Hub, and and it could be used by any session in um, in ESIP. Uh, and probably the person to talk to would be Annie, or Megan probably, or even Aaron. You know, if you if you need that, if you if you want to do something at an ESIP meeting in that genre. Um, that I think is a is a good thing to do, and it's 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 sort of been done before, so it makes it a little easier. Thanks. Other, other question? Yeah. So I agree that having like the hub type technology is really awesome for doing workshops and things like that to get people started, but I think. You also need to get over the pain point of like doing something on your own machine so you can continue working with it in your own projects. And I think that's where a lot of people kind of drop off is they'll go to one of these workshops and they'll kind of have the notebook on, you know, ESA Pub or whatever. And then they're like, okay, great, I wanna do this for my project at home, but I need to have something on my machine and I don't know how to get that set up. So that can be a big hurdle for people. So having some easy, Resources on how to just get it started on your computer could also be really helpful. Uh, I, I'm going to hand this over to, to Stace and Chris because Python, we installed it in the hotel bar in about in about 10 minutes or less, and uh, ours pretty much the same way. So uh, let's see. We'll start with the local display. Here we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there, is, there is no fun or Place to learn programming than in the bar or a coffee shop. <laughs> I'll just do a quick response because um, I wanted to give a shout out for a community that aids with uh, training. I mentioned two day workshops because one of my former instructors is right here. Um, software Carpentry and the Carpentry is inclusive of Software Carpentry. Um, does espouse the installation locally, right? Because you, because I, we totally get it. Like, so if you have enough time to have people install things locally, it allows for more retention over time, and people will have it good to go when they leave the room. I guess I would second that. That installing locally is super important for learning how to do it and having any confidence um, in it. I have that big list of the free sources, and those are, I think, where you should just be wetting your feet before you get in on your own. Yeah, and I'm 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 also motivated to hear more about that because uh, I have installed Jupyter notebooks on my sort of PC in my office for the last year, and I haven't figured out how to do anything other than edit text files. And I'm obviously I'm missing a piece. Somebody can help me with that piece. I'll be good to go. So, uh, any other any additional uh, questions or comments or ideas about what we might uh, what might do to help uh, move things forward. Okay, along that same line. So it would be cool then for those short workshops if you could have try to get people set up in advance, like having some instructions, 
and allow them to try to run it locally, but then also have like the fallback of ease of pub. So, okay, your installation isn't working. Let's, you can move over to this instance and continue to follow along. I think that would actually be pretty cool. Um, and then I have another question. So I love Jupyter Notebooks and I use Python, um, but whenever I use R, I always go into R Studio and I'm trying to remember why, because I feel like once I tried to use R in Jupyter Notebooks and I feel like a lot of the, some of the packages don't work. Is that true? Or was I like, should I try, try again using R in Jupyter? Um, well, so I'll respond to your first comment first that maybe it's an idea for, for the next ESIP meeting to have this be like a two session uh, event where the first session is trying to help people get set up locally and get familiar and then the second session can be doing something either locally or using one of these web environments. Um, and then this is a little bit speaking above my competence, but um, my experience also is that R is a little bit um, more of a pain to use in notebooks. Um, both my experience personally and then at Axiom, we, we have the R kernel in the notebooks that we host. And I know that maintaining that on the back end for our engineers is a lot more difficult than the Python one. And I don't know why that is. I know that using R in a Windows environment, the package management is much easier than in a Linux environment. And so maybe it just has to do with the way that we're hosting that. But it, yeah, it does seem my experience matches yours. I'll pass it down to Stace because I think she has some things no, there, but I, I'm going to anticipate her and say also that uh, that within our studio there is also the the knitting the knit R and the markdown capabilities that sort of mirror some of the things you can do in a Jupyter notebook within our it's or within our studio itself. There's a comment here. Yes, I, I just wanted to follow up on the one that you said you were having problem with R. I don't know if you, uh, any of you have tried Microsoft's Open. So Microsoft has R that's open normally, like, you know, it comes like a one uh, iteration less, like a six months later, but they recompile the whole CRAN libraries. So I, I suggest looking at the Microsoft R open, that's much more robust and they basically clean up the library as well. So if you're not, I mean, looking for something that you want to use right away, then the new modules came out, the new library, then maybe looking at some of the Microsoft R open is a good way and it integrates pretty well with the R as well, and others as well. But like, it's just totally out of topic, but also from, in, I'm, I'm from Esri, and we have R, so like in our in platform, we have also integrated R as a part of the bridge, right? So you, you can actually just, do, there's a piece of code, it reads the, the library, you can create a separate uh, Conda environment where you can install, and that does not gonna mess up with your other libraries as well. So. Yeah, if, if you're interested on in looking at that, I'll be happy to integrate. But that lets you actually bring in some of the libraries that you can pull from the Conda, but also uh, you can pull from the R ArcPy libraries and the Python, RGS Python API that you can do much more on that. Do you mind? I want to respond a little bit, um, also because maybe someone in the room might have a good answer for this. So there are many use cases that I have and my students have, in which we want to combine a workflow that combines part of the process in Python and part in R. And so I've used Jupyter Notebooks to do this with magic extensions to R. I've tried to, I usually use the Python kernel, magic extension to R. And now with RStudio, we're trying the R plus the Python console. But neither of these seems to be working in like a perfect way for me. So I'm wondering if anyone else out there has had this situation where they want to use both R and Python in their in their combined workflow and like which solution did they choose? I don't have direct experience with this, but I know that this is one of the use cases for Jupyter Lab. So you guys might look into that. Hi, I was wondering, um, so I've done some work in GIMP for photo editing and I was curious on the platforms that were discussed today, um, is there good functionality in the software for photo editing? So with respect to like white balance and filtering and. I'm just checking, I heard photo editing, but do you mean like an image processing toolkit in general? C correct, right, so post-processing, um, you know, if you're shooting in the raw, right, a, a means to correct 
uh, components I mean, of the photo? Um, I can follow up with you afterwards. I can show you the, the packages that we use in Python, but I don't actually know about image processing uh, packages for R. Yeah, I was going to say I I would I have not uh, done a, done image processing in Python uh, per se. I've usually used uh, things like Image Magic and and uh, and Image J externally, but it would not surprise me in the least if there weren't links that you could use in in Python that would allow you to sort of get that same functionality. Uh, in R, I wouldn't rule out that somebody will do it because you can never bet against 15,000 packages. Uh, but, the, uh, uh, but, I, but generally speaking, Python is going to be sort of a more general purpose thing. R really does have a statistical bent. And so if you're not doing statistics things, it's maybe a little, little less likely that it's going to, going to work. So it looks uh, here that there's a magic package, which is an R package binding to the image magic for advanced image processing in R. Looks like that does exist. M-A-G-I-C-K. While we're waiting for other questions, I will say for those of you who want to try to learn R and Python at exactly the same time, I don't really recommend it. That's how I did it, and boy, can you get confused. <laughs> Hi, I want to thank you for a great session, and I just have a question about Python. Can you hear me? Okay, so my question is um, when doing analysis and statistics, Will I get exactly the same results on Windows that I will on Unix? I, I can I can only say that you should. <laughs> uh, the the uh, I mean the thing is that that it's going to depend obviously on the way the the on the the skill of the of the package creator in terms of uh, of the algorithms that they've used as to whether or not they are robust relative to the different underlying software architectures. If you're talking about the thing, the creators of the, the NumPy package, in, uh, which is the, the Python package for doing sort of a lot of numerical things, that was written at a you know, fairly high level, so I would anticipate that they would get the exact same answer. But I have to confess that I never trust any statistical package or, or any program until I've taken an example that I know what the answer should be, run it through, and made sure that it comes out to be the be the right uh, the right answer. Uh, you should you should always be a little bit suspicious of results. Uh, but I will say that it's a whole lot better than uh, than Excel, where you might end up with a three-year error just due to the fact you went from a PC to a Mac. <laughs> other experiences sort of cross-platform. I jump back and forth between uh, between Linux and PC all the time uh, using both Python and and uh, and R and I haven't really noticed any differences but between them other than the fact that some of the packages are a little harder to install in in Linux in, in R on Linux than on uh, PC but that's the, that's the tidy verse and that's a big package. How many people here know, uh, other than Colin's example, no tidy verse versus base R? Okay, yeah. Uh, basically, what that what it is is that uh, uh, you notice that uh, Colin's examples in R of the the documents there, the name Hadley Wickham came up a lot. Hadley Wickham and and his group are the ones behind R Studio. And they have also come up with a number of ways of duplicating capabilities that were there in base R, but were there in ways that were syntactically obscure or difficult to figure out, and tried to put them into sort of a more logical framework so that you can, so that it's often easier to use those. And the collection of all of the, the things that they've done fall into what they call the tidyverse. They had something called tidy R that was supposed to be R that was sort of cleaner and easier to use. And, and that's what the tidyverse is about. So it's essentially a second dialect of R. 
if you go to the, the uh, EDI website and you pull up any of the data sets there, you will be able to download either a base R version of code that will run on the data set, or you can download a copy of the tidy R version that you, will operate on the data set, sort of depending on, on which you prefer. But that's what, what when we talk about the tidy verse, that's what that's about. Did I get that right, Colin? You certainly did. <laughs> Additional questions. Again, any ideas as to as to what we could do to, uh, to to help people get past sort of the barriers that you came here for a reason. We want to make sure that you uh, you you leave with uh, with a way to get past the, any barriers that you've got. And just to add to that, if you came expecting something different from what we gave you, we're also interested in hearing that. Because we wanted to get, we we knew that we weren't going to be able to teach you Python and R and Jupyter notebooks in one session, uh, but uh, uh, but we did want to give you at least a reason as to why you might want to have those, those capabilities. How, just in terms of uh, of hands here, how many people came here sort of looking for information on Python? Okay, the the smatter. Okay, how many people came here looking for information on R? Okay, similar. How many people came here looking for Jupyter notebooks? Okay, <laughs> so it looks as if it looks as if Jupyter notebooks is sort of the the biggest sort of demand area in terms of of getting sort of additional resources out there or additional help. The other question I have is for those of you who may already be sort of more conversant with Jupyter Notebooks, were there any particular resources you found to be particularly helpful in getting you started and, and getting you going? Well, well. I'll let you say what got you started or how, what was useful for you. I think um, my experience with Jupyter Notebooks is that they can be challenging to install locally and run locally because um, they were definitely more challenging before, but now with distributions like the Anaconda distribution that has a basically a graphical launch, you can now launch your Jupyter Notebook and it's a heck of a lot easier for someone who's us usually using GUIs and not um, command line prompt. Well, the question was a, a, a little bit in terms of about what was what made it easier. What were the tools that or approaches that you found that made it easier for you get to get started with the notebooks? Oh, I, I I'm going to answer a slightly different version of that. And I think that the like what appealed to me initially about notebooks and sort of sucked me in was finding people who were doing just much cooler things than I was capable of, and then being able to walk through what they were doing, and then appreciating the environment from that end. So I would turn that around a little bit. So for me, using Jupyter Notebooks was actually what helped me learn Python because um, it just seemed so much easier to like read what was going on and like, I don't know, for me just like format it. Because I didn't really understand the whole like you write a script and then you run the whole script. Like that never, I was like, I never could figure out how to make that work for what I needed it to do. And so I love the notebooks just like, execute one cell at a time and see what happens. And then I also have a question about ESIP Lab, which I don't know if any of you are actually know much about ESIP Lab, but is that like a separate installation or like, I've heard it now a couple of times and I'm like, maybe I need to look into this, but what is it? I, do you mean ESIP Hub, what Ted mentioned or? or no, okay. did I say well, the I wrong answer. thing? I meant, Jupyter Lab, is that what I said? That's what I meant. Okay. Jupyter Lab? Yeah, so Jupyter Lab, um, it's. So the question is about Jupyter Lab? 
Yeah, so Jupyter Lab is a it's it aimed to be a web-based, fully featured IDE for authoring notebooks in a variety of languages. So it's, it it might be the answer to if you want to work in Python and in R. Um, it sounds it sounds great. I don't have any experience with it right now, but it does sound like a, a really cool tool. Okay, I'm not not seeing any more hands shooting up there. And if we get a five minute start on the break, that will probably put us in good stead for getting the coffee first. So if there are no complaints, we will adjourn. Thank you everyone for attending.